is Earth Day. I don't own a blue box. I live in one. People ask me how I stand it, living in a closed system. So what is Earth? Too bad you aren't up here. Then you'd really understand limited resources. Then you'd see the Earth has limits. Then you'd be the one stuck up here saying, hit it, Nancy. <laughs> Rising anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. Here's a vote that the English only signed 40,000 tons of oil with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Science fiction has always been concerned about the future, about technology and progress, so it clued into ecology 50 years before everyone else smelled the coffee, which makes great compost, by the way. Today, the environment is the issue in serious science fiction and in the not-so-serious. Douglas Adams wrote The Looney Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was recycled into books, albums, and a TV series. His latest book, Last Chance to See, is a hilarious non-fiction look at endangered species. Douglas, it's Rick. How does an SF comedy writer end up writing a book like Last Chance to See? Well, it all started out when uh, a few years ago I was sent to Madagascar um, by the Observer Colour magazine in England. And this is one of these things that uh, you kind of think, have they got the right person? Sorry. <laughs> um, but no, they, they, they did mean me. And so I went off to Madagascar. And the point of the trip was to look for this very rare species of lima called the eye eye. I didn't know anything about it. I'd never heard of the eye eye. Um, so, uh, because basically what I was bringing to this project was a, an immense stock of um, uh, ignorance and incompetence, um, they sent along a zoologist from the World Wildlife Fund, Mark Carwardin, to, to mastermind it and make sure I knew what I was doing, knew where I was going, and didn't fall out of boats too much. Good idea. So did you and Mark finally lay eyes on the eye eye? After several nights, the animal's nocturnal, which makes it increases the difficulty of finding it. Several nights of um, traipsing through the rain forest in what can only be described as the rain, um, we did eventually see one for about 10 seconds in the pouring rain. And it was a revelatory experience for me. And I was so transfixed by this creature. Um, so um, afterwards, I phoned up Mark and said, um, I want to do more of this. You know, can we set up a whole project where we go by, where we, by we go around the world and, and look for a number of other endangered animals? And he said, uh, sure, that's what I do for a living. So while searching for the Komodo dragon and the Kakapo, you stumbled through China, Indonesia, Zaire. What made Madagascar so fascinating? From up here, it just looks like a triple Manhattan. It's like a sort of, a, uh, not exactly an arc in space, more a sort of arc in time, um, because uh, it split off from Africa when Gondwana land split up. It almost sounds like some sort of 70s rock band going their own way for reasons of musical differences. But this is the supercontinent that you know, comprised most of the southern hemisphere. Um, and when it split up, uh, when, it, when, when Madagascar sailed off into the Indian Ocean, it took with it a sort of stock of the typical wildlife of the time. And of course, it's been completely isolated from the west, from the rest of the world since then. So the uh, it's pursued its own rather slower evolutionary course, and the and the ecology there is completely unique. So it is the most extraordinary and fascinating place. And there's so much to find out about. I can't improve on the cliche, I'm afraid, which says, you know, there's a whole world out there that I knew nothing about. And um, here I've, I've been busy inventing worlds, and this one we've got here is astounding. It sure is. And Douglas, thanks for faxing me up your book. It's a scream. I wish more people faxed me. Nature, ecosystems, closed environments. Very familiar territory in science fiction. Sherry Tepper's upcoming novel, Beauty, compares Mother Nature to Sleeping Beauty. Nature looks like she's been 86, but hopefully it's just 40 winks. And Gar and Judith Reeve Stevens have just finished an ecological novel called Slide, set at the Olympic Games in the year 2000. Guys, it's Commander Rick. Seems like science fiction and ecology are thick as thieves these days. Absolutely, but I yes. think it's always been in science fiction. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, 
even going back to Make Room, Make Room, Harry Harrison's novel is made into the, yeah. uh, the movie Soylent Green. Soylent Green, Green the Charlton I mean, the, the opening, uh, the epigraph to that novel is that 10% uh, of the world's population can no longer go on consuming 90% mm -hmm. of, the, of the world's resources. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's... Um, Ecological awareness has always been in science fiction yeah. because they've always been concerned with limited resources and technology and Mm. how people react to changes in uh, the availability of mm -hmm. a resource. Mm -hmm. That's made for interesting stories. And they've always projected into the future, and certainly uh, the issues that are facing us now in a more concrete way have always been there. And I'd say science fiction writers were amongst the most aware of them. Oh, yes. David Brin has a wonderful new book out called Earth, uh, which, if, if it carries any message, carries the message that this is the only planet we've got that it's up to us to care for it, it's our responsibility, and we really ought to start cleaning up our mess. You know, other animals were smart enough to bury their wastes. Uh, maybe we can find even more clever things to do with ours than throw them in a great big pile and then build our houses elsewhere. We talk about man or humanity and nature as if they're separate things. One of the things I wanted to do in Face of God is have postulate a life form which doesn't have that duality, which never for a minute sees itself as the pinnacle of creation or sees itself as separate from the natural world. Every individual is responsible to one degree or another for their own food gathering, food production. You understand that, hey, if I pollute here, then my food source there is going to disappear. And it's very home and real for you. It's not like, well, if I, you know, dump my garbage out in the back river, then the A&P isn't going to have what I want. It's not like that. It's if I wreck up the environment, suddenly there's less, less cow-like reptiles for me to kill and eat. Robert's aliens realize every species is a product of and dependent upon its environment. That's not a new idea. You'll even find it in the trashy old sci-fi flicks. My expert on those B-movies is Julian Grant from Sinister Cinema. Julian, it's the commander. Ecological movies like Soylent Green or No Blade of Grass come from the 60s and 70s, but it goes back farther, doesn't it? Ecology in the B-movie film, I think, really hit it off uh, as early as the 1950s, where we had mutated bugs thanks to atomic radiation uh, causing all sorts of problems throughout you know, the Midwestern United States. Uh, we had that great ant film, Them, in which giant sized ants, you know, wiggling their antennas, trash Los Angeles. We may be witnesses to a biblical prophecy come true. Here is a wild, headlong flight into terror as the desert erupts with a grim battle for survival. Is there any type of gas we could use? No, we can't take a chance. It might poison the whole city. Ecology as, you know, an overall viewpoint or stance, I suppose, uh, was very important to the Japanese filmmakers, and they realized that, and with Godzilla and all of his cousins and the various rubber-suited monsters, most of them were spawned by the atomic bomb or a crack in the Earth's crust that somehow met up with some man-made chemicals and flying turtles were born. Once small and happy lizards became these angry, you know, town-kicking mutants. Mm -hmm. These things just really aren't done anymore. Uh, in the 1990s, you know, the world is so screwed up, and as a result, maybe the impact of these what-if films is kind of lost because it's happening all around us. I mean, if the Simpsons are doing tales about three-headed fish, and, you know, people are really responding to it, not as, oh, this is impossible, but yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, it's true. I mean, there are hundreds of instances, you know, in the news of where pollution of our land, our lake, uh, the very air we breathe is, is common. Maybe it's a horror that's a bit too close. Uh, although, I don't know, I'd like to see another smog monster film real soon. Maybe taking on L.A. or something. You know, finally crushing the town and, you know, leaving happy. <laughs>